So I want to welcome uh, those of you who are here to our the Brickstore Museum's virtual presentation on the history of Scandinavian uh, or Scandinavian history in Kenny Bunk, I should say. Um, with many thanks to the wonderful Kathy Ostrander Roberts, who is our town historian, <laughs> for speaking with us about this topic. Um, the museum's candlelight stroll event, which this is stemming from, uh, it's typically over the past few years, it runs as a two evening event that uh, where reenactors portray um, historic uh, citizens from the early 20th century who emigrated to the United States from throughout the world, or at least those we could find on the census. Uh, and this year it's transitioning to a multi-layered month long festival of traditions and going forward, we're going to um, celebrate it that way in coming years. So with that, our lectures like this one, uh, reenactments still on Fridays and Saturdays, the pop-up exhibit of the uh, immigrant stories that we've been telling for the past few years, and even a holiday driving tour. So you can jump in your car and use your smartphone and visit some of the locations that Kathy's going to mention, as well as some other places like where was the first Christmas tree in town, which we hopefully have right. Kathy can tell us. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about that later. <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. Um, most of this programming obviously is offered for free because we love to do it that way at the museum. But if you would like to support our work, um, you are more than welcome to, and we'd be honored by your donation uh, through the museum's website, in person, mail, uh, however you like to do that. Um, and during the Festival of Traditions this entire month, uh, we've decided that because we're talking about immigrant stories uh, and how that contributes to the town and our shared culture, all of our donations is going to be split between the museum and four other cultural centers here in Southern Maine that are doing the work to share the stories of immigrant Mainers. So we have more information on those four uh, organizations that we've selected on our website. So if you go to brickstormuseum.org slash festival of traditions, you can see which ones we've selected. <laughs> um, <clears throat> just a couple last notes. Our next lecture, if you haven't registered already, is a week from now, next Wednesday, uh, and it's by Rabbi Dr. David Frydenreich of Colby College. He's going to be speaking on the main Jewish experience. I also invite you, obviously, to join us for any of the Festival of Traditions events that are running through December 22nd. So without further ado, uh, here's our town historian, Kathy Ostrander-Roberts. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you all for being here. I'm looking at some of the names. I see some, definitely some Scandinavian sounding last names for some of you. Um, I always think that stories about our town are best given when there's a personal element. And um, this story about Scandinavian immigration to Kennebunk definitely has a rings of personal chord with me, um, and I'll tell you why. About 35 years ago, gosh, I'm counting, I moved to Kennebunk uh, with my husband and we bought a house on Winter Street. It was number four, Winter Street. And um, a little aside, just for those of us grumbling about the current interest rates, we paid 18% interest rate back then. Um, nothing to do with the story. Anyway. That house needed an awful lot of work. So we dove in right away and just started finding these weird, strange coincidences come up. Um, I was in, it had a barn, not a garage. Um, and when I went out to the barn one day, I noticed a loose board. I lifted it up and there was a time capsule there, a time capsule of sorts. On the very top was the wing of a World War II model airplane. Under another layer of newspapers, there was a Gumby and Pokey set. A lot of you won't probably know what that is, but most of us remember. Below that was a long handled corn popper from the late 1800s. And on the very, very bottom was this piece of paper. So in looking at it, it was a little unnerving when I read that this little newspaper clipping was about um, a bunch of Syracuse, New York boys living on Ostrander Avenue. That was the gist of the story, which is kind of strange because I came from the Syracuse, New York area, and my last name is not that common, was then Ostrander. So kind of like the Twilight Zone started, and kind of kind of creepy, but we continued renovating. And the next thing that happened was 
In removing the wallpaper from a bedroom wall, it took forever. And as we um, kept working at it, we soon started seeing words, a, a word being um, painted on the on the plaster underneath. It was at least a, a foot high. And the first letter was M, followed by A-R-K. So my husband's name was Mark. So we, again, got a little bit skittish over this, thought that was a little strange. But when we had finally uncovered the rest of the wall, we realized that it said Mark IV, which we learned later was a Bible passage. So with all that in mind, I, I wondered who the heck built this house? Um, who were they? I mean, a lot of people who move here, they, they have the same thing and they want to know more about their house. So of course, where do you go? You go to the Brickstore Museum. I went to the brick store and I found this great photo of the house. And in the photo, it shows this family out front and they're showing all, all of their um, material wealth, so to speak. They've got um, horses for the kids, bicycles, swings, ch they're a chair, a fancy uh, pram for the baby. And these are the people. Well, I didn't know who those people were. So I continued my research and um, I think that that research of the Scandinavian history of Kennebunk, which turned it out to be, was the reason I became town historian after all. Um, I learned that Anton Tvet, which I was said wrong for most of my life, it was actually Tweed, T-V-E-D-T, -E um, he came from Norway and built that house um, in 1893, shortly after Winter Street had been opened up as, as a road by the town. His niece also built a house on Winter Street at number 18. Um, so I wanted to know more about the, the Tveds or Tvets as, they, as I, I said it. And I learned that in 1883, there was a great influx of Norwegians to Kennebunk and the Tweeds came in 1883 on a ship with 151 other people from their hometown of Arundel, Norway, no coincidence there, I don't think. And they landed in America. Um, I think I w often wondered why they came. And I, you know, you can read a lot of things and you, you find that they had a lot of economic collapses in Norway. They had a lot of steamship companies promoting America and job employment and job opportunities. They had uh, quite a bit of uh, religious persecution in Norway at that time too. And um, and I actually think that a lot of the reasons that they came to Kennebunk specifically and Maine were uh, word of mouth letters from relatives who had come here before. For instance, there was a fellow named George Christensen who came in the 1860s. He was a, a, a ship builder. Well, he had he had built he was responsible for building about 30 vessels here in Kennebunk. And Christensen was a very popular name amongst the following immig the immigrants that came to follow after him. And so I think that some of that was, you know, uh, relatives writing home saying how great their opportunities had been and, and what they were able to accomplish and so on and so forth. And, um, and that brought a lot of them here. In fact, um, between the years of 1880 and um, 1894, I think there was something like 255,000 immigrants arrived here from Norway and Sweden and the Scandinavian countries alone, uh, not to mention those from other countries. Um, immigration stories sometimes have great context and, and happy endings, and sometimes they don't. Uh, the French had it more difficult. There was quite a lot of... Um, uh, hatred of, of different people coming in and taking jobs. But luckily, the uh, Scandinavians who came here thrived and were able to do quite well. In fact, when Samuel and his father and brother came here, Anton and Samuel Jr. in 1883, they immediately found jobs in what was called the Leatheroid factory. Leatheroid is kind of a paper fiber press product that looks, it's, it's meant to resemble leather. And they used it to create uh, steamer trunk coverings, um, something called a roving can for the mill industries. They used it to make shoe counters, which in the back of, in the heel of a shoe is a kind of a crescent shaped 
piece of fiberboard that was being manufactured here in Kennebunk uh, for the shoe industry for many, many years. Fiberboard itself was created in the 1870s, late 1870s in uh, West Virginia and moved then to Pennsylvania. And it was brought here in 1881 by a man named Emery Andrews and his partners, um, the Rogers brothers. So by 1883, when Samuel and Anton arrived um, and their father, and then subsequently the other family members, they had they were readily able to get into this factory that um, had started up here on the Malzahn River that was brought here by Emery Andrews. Um, they did so well at the factory that they were both, Samuel and Anton were promoted um, to foreman and they were able to then reach out back to their country and bring in many, many other um, friends and neighbors to Kennebunk um, to work in the in the factory, in the leather leatherboard factory. So that by 1907, there were several people um, of Norwegian descent here. Um, there were the Olsons, the Hansons, the Jensens, the Knudsens, uh, Christiansens, for of all, um, just to name a few, at least 20 different families um, in 1907. And um, they all seemed to prosper. The, there were single women who came that worked as domestics in some of the bigger houses. There were um, a couple of um, Scandinavian ladies who opened a dressmaking shop. And the men, for the most part, worked in these leatherboard and shoe counter factories. Back to Anton in Tibet, Anton and Samuel, they, as foremans, um, did quite well financially and were able to build themselves homes. Samuel built one on Day Street. Um, Anton, of course, built the one that I owned. Uh, his um, Their sister lived on at the 18 Winter Street location. Some lived on um, uh, Carson Street, some on Hubby Street. Um, so they kind of... Uh, all got together and decided that because they were from the same area and they were of the Lutheran faith, that they needed a church. In 1893, Anton was able to purchase the land in order to buy a church for his his brother, uh, Samuel, to preach in. Samuel was a bit of a strange dude. He thought himself to be the preacher, the savior, and um, and had a tendency to stand in the middle of town on a box with his long flowing hair and his Bible and, and preach to the wind to anybody who would hear. And um, as early as 1883, when he got here, he was preaching in um, Biddeford at the, on the Oak Ridge Road in a big old gospel tent. And there's quite a lot of stories in newspaper archives that talk about the, the uh, fever and the pitch in which he would preach. But when his brother built the church on Hall Street, now Five Hall Street, he um, decided that's where he would be the preacher of. And he, um, uh, his brother Anton actually accompanied him in his sermons on his guitar. And it, it lasted for a number of years. This is a picture of Samuel and his long flowing coat and his long hair and his Bible. And this is kind of blurry is Anton, his brother, who accompanied, accompanied him on the guitar and built our home. So it's kind of nice to, this again is a brick store photo. So if you're researching your house, a little pitch for the brick store, come here. Um, let's see, two year, uh, let's see. Samuel, as I said, he, he, he fancied himself as a preacher. And I think that when in 1893, when Anton built our house, Samuel probably had a hand in that. And hence the um, large giant Bible passage of Mark 4 was put on the wall for someone to find uh, down the road. And ironically, you know, in, in 1930, the factory closed, that the Leatherite factory closed. And um, Anton moved away to New Jersey with his family. And Samuel uh, started his own cement block factory and demolition factory in which he would go around and dem demolish buildings. 
So, um, but he stayed here his entire life. Most of the Norwegians who came here um, and lived and died here are buried in Mount Pleasant Cemetery up on York Street. However, I don't think there are more than a, a handful of stones for all of the immigrants who are buried in that cemetery. A lot of them never made it back home to their home countries to visit. I know that Anton did get to go home with his family of four children in 1907, but many others never got to see their homelands again. Um, when I sold this house finally, and, and I moved on to my next house, um, I decided I would leave a time capsule there myself. So in the floorboards of Four Winter Street is a box with photos of the house, this photo specifically, some deeds and various things. Um, there are some things called pogs, which was something my kids played with when they were little, um, and just some other fun, fun items to be found another hundred years from now. There's also a full-size mural on one wall buried under a false wall um, that I left so that maybe a hundred years from now, someone will look back and say, who the heck were they? So similarly, all of our, our ancestry and heritage stories kind of relate in our town. And, and I think that the Scandinavians had such a big uh, part in making Kennebunk what it was that they are, they should be celebrated as well. And that's it. Questions? Cindy? Um, if anybody, ha thank you, Kathy. If anybody sure. has a <laughs> question um, for Kathy, uh, you're more than welcome again to type it in the chat or if you feel brave enough, you're welcome to unmute <laughs> your, uh, <laughs> your microphone and just ask away. Um, as folks are thinking of questions, uh, Kathy, could you... Um, you mentioned it quickly and I was just wondering about, um, and you, I should mention to everybody, if, if you don't know already, Kathy knows almost, every, or well, pretty much every cemetery here in, in town. I see dead people. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I was just, you said the, that, what cemetery did you name, I guess? Was um, well, all of the Scandinavians for, from what I have found are buried in Mount Pleasant and that's up by well, I used to call it, it used to be Herbs, um, but oh, now it's the new restaurant called Smoke. So it's the, the cemetery there on the hill. And I've not found any of their headstones, even though I see in the vital records that they were buried there. And I, I'm not, I'd like to dig into that more someday and find out if that was a tradition that they maybe didn't believe in headstones or just seems kind of uncanny that, you know, hundreds of people wouldn't have headstones. Right. Oh, that's funny. Is that strange? <laughs> Yeah, that is strange. It's the quirky stuff I find out. You're either a nerd or you're not. <laughs> I am a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> That's very interesting. Oh, uh, okay. Peter says, you mentioned, I think that 255,000 Scandinavians came here between 1880. Well, let me, yeah, and let me clarify. I want to make sure that that's, that's America. That's not Kenny Bunk. We didn't have, <laughs> I wasn't probably very clear on that. We didn't have, that was overall. Um, America, over 255,000 immigrants came. Um, a lot of them came because the weather, I mean, to Maine, because the weather was the same too, I mean, to their hometown. And Arendelle, A-R-E-N-D-A-L, where they came, ours came from, ours, the Tibets came from, was also a shipbuilding town. So it's kind of similar that they came for those reasons, you know, to, to come to someplace that seemed familiar, I think was part of their reasoning. Hope that answered the question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. That's fantastic. Oh, That's good. good. So thank you. So must have. Oh, yeah. <laughs> good clarification. So I was, I was mentioning to Cindy, um, you all have your own heritage stories, I'm sure. And those of you interested in Scandinavians may have a Scandinavian background. But if you have any of the any information in your families about the mills that were once here on the Malism or artifacts, or even if it's not related to the Scandinavians, we'd surely love to have you uh, share that information with the brick store. As Cin Cynthia had said, there's a, a there's an email. Get me if I'm wrong, Cynthia. Info at brickstoremuseum.org. Right. And you can reach out and say, hey, I've, I've got something to, to tell. 
Yes. Thank you, Kathy. That's a really nice plug. Um, <laughs> I realized as we started doing these candlelight stroll programs, talking about the different cultural heritage in uh, Kennybunk, that we don't have a lot of three-dimensional or archival material that relate, especially to um, folks that may not have been the ones that live, for instance, on Summer Street, who decided to keep their portraits and their journals and their pictures and everything. Um, so we have a real lack of uh, material culture that that relate to all of the other folks that were living here and celebrating. The other uh, day working uh, persons. That's yeah. right. <laughs> exactly. yeah. So yeah. thank you for that plug. That was really important. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Um, it's it's amazing what what eras we, and it, I find too, as an aside, we are missing air, um, artifacts and stories from the 60s and 70s of 1900s. Um, it seems like after the Vietnam War or World War One, even and two, even they stopped collecting things and sharing them. So museums kind of have deficits in those areas too. So if you have something along those lines, um, share. <laughs> That's fantastic. Thank you, Kathy. As you can You're tell, Kathy is a very passionate uh, town historian, and we are. Nerd. She's a treasure. <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh, uh, Norma has, a, I was just about to, to ask if anyone had any more questions. So Norma says, do you know about the Norwegian village in Berlin, New Hampshire? I don't, but I do know that there was a good deal of Norwegian immigration to New Hampshire, specifically Dover, the Dover area. In fact, some of the Tvets who eventually turned their uh, spelling of their name to Tweed, T-W-E-E-D, um, they actually lived in Dover, New Hampshire, um, but no, not specifically that town, I don't. But I think wherever there were shoe factories or other kind of industries that, that they could um, find employment, they moved to. That makes sense. And thank you for telling us all how to pronounce that, because I've also... I spelled, I said it wrong for years, T-V-E-D-T, -T, <laughs> you know, I've heard it, I've heard people say tweet. But then when they changed their names, when they moved to New Jersey to T-W-E-E-D, I guess they kind of were trying to make a point. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> wow, I appreciate that. Sure. Uh, so everyone, if you think of questions later, uh, Kathy already said one of the email addresses that you're welcome to email. So info at brickstermuseum.org with your questions, and we will most likely forward them to Kathy, and then she will be able to answer them. Um, but again... Happy, happy to. <laughs> <laughs> if um you know if you want to share your family stories or anything that you have also do that or and if you have not to interrupt but i do it all the time <laughs> if you have um uh, you want to research your house in in kenny bunk this is the place to do it nice that's right exactly <laughs> we do all things um, and then again, join us for other events that are coming up here at the museum in the next month. And then we're closed for about a week uh, and then we'll be back in January. So um, feel free to filter those questions in and then wishing everybody a happy holiday season. Happy holidays. <laughs> Thank Bye. you, everybody. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you. Bye.